Good afternoon. Thank you, Gina. That was just a wonderful introduction. And that we, Tori and I were so pleased to have the opportunity to spend a little time with you last night and talk a little bit this morning. I'm honored to be here among you all to have an opportunity to, and to have an opportunity and to engage with you all in the 2020 census. I think, as Gina said, it's been almost a year to the day since I was here last year. And it was such a wonderful opportunity and such an engaging discussion. We'll have to see what this one brings. But the bar has set, been set very high. So I'm excited to do this. So thank you. In the time we have um, today, we're going to focus on a couple of things related to the 2020 Census. We're going to focus and provide a high-level discussion of the design of the 2020 Census. We'll also provide an update on our planning, our research, our testing, and frankly, given where we are today, our execution related to the Census itself. And then we have a very interesting interlude in our discussion because Tori is going to share with you all some results from our 2015 National Content Test. Why is this an interesting opportunity? The Census Bureau is actually releasing those results of the test later this afternoon, sometime between one and three, we hope, since we're sharing them with you all now. <laughs> so fingers are crossed on that one, but if all goes well, they should be out. You know, I, I know you're familiar with the slide. Why do we do a census? Why do, or at least with the information presented on it, what, what is the purpose of the census? Why do we do it? Uh, how important is it? How are the data used? All of those are great questions, and all of those set the stage when we talk and engage with different data users about the importance of the census. But what I want to talk about today are a few things beyond this, right? What I want to talk about today is how this census will be different. This census will be like no other census we've ever taken. And if you've been around demography, if you've been around the census, you've heard us all say that every decade. <laughs> every decade. We say, this census will be like no other census. So as a, someone who's studied the census, as someone who's worked on the census, this will be my third in some way, shape, or form, um, kind of looking back up until 1970, 1970 was really the last time we made wholesale changes. After 1970, we took a census every 10 years, but what that census really was was something we kind of call the N plus one. We take the design of the last census, we look at it, we tinker a little bit at the edge, and we roll it out and say the census will be like no other census. And, and that's what we've done. And the censuses have been good, right? If we look back to the last census and look at the coverage measurement statistics, look at the results of the post-enumeration survey, undercount, very, very small. Quality of the census, very, very good. Tori can speak to that ad nauseum because she was responsible for one of those analyses that were done. But the cost of the census was changing and escalating in ways that we could not control. The census that we were taking up through the last census was a census that we could no long, should no longer do. Techniques, data, methodology, all had advanced to the point that we could and we should change. And that's what I'll be focusing on today. So what are some of the things we had to think about as we thought about replanning the census? There is not, I'm confident, that there is not a single circle on this slide that you all have not thought about in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's complex family dynamics, whether it's a diverse population, whether it's the fact that all surveys across all social science research response rates have been continuing to decline um, for decades. The fact that we're all dealing, we were talking about this a little bit last night, with the public's response and the public's concern about government, distrust in government, or just the simple information explosion. We are all inundated thanks to our smartphones, our watches, our TV. We are inundated with information at an alarming rate that when someone calls or someone sends us a questionnaire or someone asks us to do something, we say, eh, maybe not, right? And it makes it harder and harder for us to do this. These are some of the factors that as we stepped back, what feels like yesterday, but the reality is it was, you know, six, seven years ago at this point, and said, how will we do this census differently? These are some of the factors that we had to take into consideration, that we had to think about, because we were starting to design the census in 2000, or I'm sorry, in 2010, for 2020. So we had to think about where were we then and where might we be 10 years from now. I've already mentioned the costs, but I do think this is a critical component for us. As you can see on this slide, the costs of the decennial census have been rising exponentially throughout time. Going back to 1970, looking to 2010, you can see actual dollars there. What we did in thinking about the census for 2020 is we estimated and we said, 
if we're going to take that same old paper and pencil census, and yeah, we'll tinker at the edges and we'll improve something, not a lot, but we'll improve some things, what would that cost be in 2020? The cost of executing the design from the 2010 census in 2020 would have been, is projected to have been, about $17.8 billion dollars over the life cycle. That compares with a cost of $12.3 billion for the 2010 census over the life cycle. That is not sustainable. That is not supportable. And frankly, we never would have received that level of funding to take the census. So we said, how can we do it differently? Where, given the environmental considerations, declining response rates, a mobile, a mobile society, people not wanting to answer the phone, how can we re-engineer the census, really not take an N plus one census, how can we re-engineer it, how can we do it differently, and how can we bring that cost down? So what we did in doing that was focus on the major cost drivers of the census. And we came up with how we're gonna use what we call new methodologies, but frankly, those methodologies have been there for a while, they're new to the approach of census taking, and bring them into what we're doing. And you can see that based on the design, our operational plan that we released in October of 2015, we estimated that the cost, if we were allowed to execute the census as we designed it, for the 2020 census would have been about $12.5 billion or more than about $5 billion in cost avoidance. So what does this look like? When I said we focused on, on the, the cost driving areas, we call them opportunities. We call them our innovation areas. And what we did is we highlighted four key areas where we felt we could really re-engineer our operations, bring the census into the 21st century and ensure lower cost and the same high level of quality that we all expect as data users. So what are those areas? The first area is re-engineering address canvassing. When I talk about address canvassing, what I'm talking about here is how we ensure that we have a complete frame of the nation. It's really important to remember that when we're talking about the census, we're not just talking about the total population. What's important to the census is understanding where that population resides. Our goal is to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. The key use of the census is for apportionment and redistricting. In order to do those two things well, we need to know where people reside. Key to that is a complete and accurate address frame. So how are we gonna re-engineer address canvassing? The way we've done address canvassing for the last two censuses is we've sent out a small army about 150,000 listers, we call them, to go out and walk every block in the nation. And when they go out and walk every block in the nation, they do what we call a dependent listing operation, where they're validating, adding, deleting, cross-checking the addresses that we have on our master address file with what they physically see on the ground. Well, I don't know about you, but when I need to go somewhere now, I pull up you know, some piece of software, some application that can be used to provide me with directions. Or if I want to see where I'm going, I pull up a different application. Do I physically need to walk every block to see this? No. We know that technology and data exist to allow us to do this differently. So we looked at how we could re-engineer address canvassing. And what we've done is we've actually successfully developed software and developed what we call an in-office address canvassing operation. So we are still canvassing the entire nation, but we're doing it with about 200 clerks sitting at our National Processing Center, looking at two computers, two, two monitors, comparing imagery, geospatial imagery, and comparing data that we have on our master address file with information from other administrative and government sources. That is our first pass. That is helping us validate where our address list is still good and where we need to go into the field to do in-field address canvassing. Based on the original design that we released in 2015, we believe that we can, we'll do a complete canvas, but we believe that about 25% of the blocks in the nation will require some level of in-field canvassing. Could be high rises, could be areas that have constant ground cover, could be areas that are going through gentrification where we can't see if units are being demolished, could be areas where there's a lot of squatters, those kinds of things. We know there are parts of the country where we will need to send people out, but it will not be for the entire nation. The second area that we focused on is self-response. We all know that the most expensive part of conducting a census is what we call non-response follow-up. If we can encourage, engage, and motivate 
the population to self-respond, then we can help keep the cost of the census down and use the resources that we have to focus on those population groups that are the hardest to count. So how are we looking to optimize self-response? First, we're using an internet-first strategy. This census, we will be taking your census responses over the internet. I know, I know, shock of all shock. We actually did test this in 2000 with a very small test, but in 2010, we did not deploy the internet for security reasons. For the 2020 census, we will. We've been actively testing this for the last few years. We feel very confident with our internet collection system. And in fact, the 2017 census test, which rolls out in March 20th, so a few short weeks, will be the first deployment of our new internet self-response application. Please, sure. You've been doing this for the um, American Community Service. Yes, yeah, we have. I was tapped twice. Right? Yes, we have. Once paper and pencil and once the internet. Mm -hmm. Two different places. Yes. So, uh, have I. Is that what you're going to, what you're building from? The, the so, ACS? no. So the ACS, um, it's, it's a little more complex than that. Yeah. So the American Community Survey is a very, very large questionnaire, but it's sent to a small proportion of housing units. For self-response for the nation, we're looking at about a six-week data collection period where we expect at different points in time to have upwards of two million concurrent users. That requires a, the complexity and the development of a system that is a little different than what we would use for an ongoing current survey. The level and the, the robustness and our ability to scale are very different. But they're very small, small questionnaire. It's a very small questionnaire, so we have about 10 topics on the census, um, anywhere from 10 to 15 questions if you count the administrative questions. But it really is the scalability that's an issue. We're also doing some very different things with the census because, again, we're trying to engage the entire population to respond. So while everyone similar to the American Community Survey will have and I will receive an ID code in their invitation letter to respond, the public will also have the opportunity to respond without an identification code. This will allow people to respond anytime, <coughs> anywhere, from any device. This is very important because we want to encourage the hard to count. We want them to have a way for them to respond, and we want to use the internet as an internet first option. That said, we recognize that not everyone has access to the internet. So in addition to the internet being a response option, other ways that we're optimizing self-response is through for the first time offering a very, very robust census questionnaire assistance project program. Our census questionnaire assistance program will allow respondents to, to respond to the census over the telephone. So if someone doesn't want or doesn't have access to the internet, they don't need to use the internet. They can call any one of our 1-800 numbers, and we're going to have them in many, many languages, available for people to respond. And some of our testing that we've done, what we did find out um, were a couple of things. We found out that in certain parts of the country where there's an older population, say over the age of 65, or where we've looked at some data from the FCC as well as the American Community Survey, there are pockets of the country without the internet. We see spikes in our telephone questionnaire assistance for those areas to help mitigate those spikes. And, to, and so what we have here are people that want to respond, they just don't know how. We haven't given them the medium. So what we did decide to do is to take about 20% of the addresses in the country, and for those 20% of the addresses, we will provide a questionnaire in the first mailing. So the vast majority of the country will not receive a census questionnaire until their fourth mailing, because we're trying to push people to use the internet. Um, if they don't, they will eventually get a questionnaire. But in the areas where we know that the population is older or has less access to the internet, we will include that questionnaire up front because we want all willing respondents to respond as quickly as possible. Also within optimizing self-response, we will also have a very robust advertising and partnership campaign. Partnership is key to us reaching those, on, those hard to count populations, really getting into the communities, having trusted voices speak with people to encourage them to respond to the census. The last two of our innovation areas I'll talk about together. It's using um, administrative records and third party data and re-engineering our field operations. Why will I talk about them together? Because to me, they both come together to how we're re-engineering our non-response follow-up operation. There's a bit more to it than that, but you know, when we're talking about the 80% solution, that is essentially what we're talking about here. What we're looking to do here is to use administrative data. So this is information that you've already provided to another source, whether it be information from the Postal Service, whether it be information that you've provided um, to Social or that Social Security has about you. Um, information that already exists 
to help us reduce the non-response follow-up workload. We're looking to do this in two ways. First, we're looking to identify vacant housing units. In the 2010 census, we sent out enumerators to what turned out to be 19 million vacant housing units. That means someone knocked on a door where we had data, most likely from the Postal Service, that told us this unit was vacant, not once, but twice, because our 2010 procedures required us to do a vacant delete check. But twice, we sent people out to confirm that something we already knew was vacant was vacant. For this census, we're going to first use administrative data to identify those housing units where we believe them to be vacant after we've completed our self-response period and remove those units from the workload. We estimate that we can safely remove about six million addresses from the non-response follow-up workload. Um, and that will help us significantly. After we do that, we're going to knock on every remaining door at least once. We believe that by knocking on every door at least once, based on our testing, based on previous census experience, we can resolve about an additional 20 to 25 percent of those non-response follow-up housing units. After we've done that, we're then going to turn to administrative data. If we haven't been able to secure a response at that point, if we know that the unit's not vacant but it is occupied, we will look to see what information we have on that housing unit and remove those housing units from the workload. This will allow us to take the limited resources that we will have and focus on those population groups where we do not have information. We will be able to make repeated attempts to really get the hard to count and to really reach into those communities. In addition to our use of administrative records and third-party data, we're also infusing technology throughout the entire life cycle of the census. We already talked about the internet first. We've already talked about telephony or census questionnaire assistance. We haven't talked about how we're re-engineering our field operations. We will be using a smartphone for our enumerators to capture data. Our supervisors will be using a tablet to allow them to do it. And one of the things we don't think about ever, unless you're trying to field this large scale operation, is how are we gonna pay people? This will be the first census where we have automated payroll. So in the past, one of the big cost drivers is all of our hundreds of thousands of enumerators had to check in every day with their supervisor. That meant they physically met to turn in their payroll at a Panera, at a McDonald's, at a local coffee shop. Hours of time was spent in these paper handoffs then hours of time was spent in a regional census center or a local census office validating and processing these forms. For this census, that will all be done electronically using the smartphone application that we're designing. With all of the changes that we're making to the infrastructure with the use of technology throughout, we're able to change the footprint of the census. So to give you a sense of what I mean by that, in the 2010 census, we had 12 regional census centers that were stood up precisely for the census. For this census, we're planning on six regional census centers. In the 2010 census, we had about 500 what we called area census offices. For this census, we're projecting that we will open about 250 area census offices. In the 2010 census, for our largest operation, non-response follow-up, we employed about 600,000 enumerators. We trained nearly 900,000, but we used about 600,000. For this census, we're expecting to utilize about 300,000 enumerators. Let's see if I can move down. So all of that brings us to the new design for the 21st century. You have a copy of this in the materials we provided you, but essentially if we look at it very simply, the census is all about this. Establishing where to count, motivating people to respond, then we count the population, and then we release the census results, like we're releasing some test results today. Um, what you see here are some of the key outreach techniques, some of the key design elements that we're planning to utilize for this census. So where are we today? That was a high level overview of the design. Where we are today, and you can see across this timeline, is we've moved from planning and, and development into implementation and execution. In many ways, the census is underway. We're building the infrastructure now. We're, we're building the systems now. We're deploying those systems. Address canvassing in office has been underway in production since September of 2015. Where we are right now is we are just finishing up our address canvassing test that we fielded over the summer. We're getting ready to start our 2017 census test. Um, and we're in the midst, the absolute midst of planning for our 2018 end-to-end -end census test. 
Everyone thinks the 2018 end-to-end -end census test is next year. Let me stand here today and tell you it starts in just a few months. The end-to-end -end census test is a dress rehearsal of the census from soup to nuts. That means we start with our address canvassing operation. We will be in the field for address canvassing in August of this year. And I believe with that, I'm going to transition over to Tori, who's going to share some data. Please, sure. What do you do with people who have two addresses, a summer home and another home? What do you sure. So we provide a number of instructions. We encourage people to respond with just the address where they're, they're where they are following our residence criteria. But we have extensive deduplication procedures that we do follow for when we do receive forms from multiple households that should only be counted in one place. Okay, so mm -hmm. so I, I got I had the problem with the ACS. I got one there. So the ACS has a different set of residence criteria right, than the, the census ACS does. Has I wrote in, they called me, we talked about it, yeah. and said, keep yourself in right. right. But, but I just didn't know how they would identify, if I get a census form under my door and my mm -hmm. apartment and one here, how would they know? So we have an extensive set of matching that we do, um, and deduplication procedures that we follow. Okay, so I'll fill Sure. A quick question on the um, number of, you said about 200 folks now sitting in front of the computers. Yes, on address canvassing. Address mm -hmm. uh, enumeration. Um, is that using proprietary information like Google Earth and so forth? And how do we feel about, if so, how do we feel about the government having to rely on um, essentially the largest yes. information of a private company? So first of all, it's not relying on Google Earth, so you can rest assured. <laughs> you can rest assured. I think, you know, so we're starting with our master address file. The Census Bureau actually has the most robust, and we've checked a lot of things the most robust address file that exists in the nation. The way we build that address file, though, is from data sources that we acquire from the Postal Service and from state and local governments. So state and local governments provide us both address lists as well as geospatial data, and they provide that to us for free. It's not something that, that we're paying for or any of those natures. They do it because they care about the results of the census. So we've had a 10-year process that we've been underway now in working with those governments to acquire their data. In addition to that, two years ago now, maybe not quite two years ago, but close to two years ago, we also purchased um, admin we also purchased commercial data from five different commercial vendors that have address and geospatial data. We've performed a series of analyses comparing the information available from the commercial vendors to the information that we had and the information that we were acquiring from state and local governments as well as the Postal Service. And we feel very comfortable. Those results haven't been released yet, but they should be released any day. There's a nice report. Um, we feel very comfortable with the address file we have and with the data sources that we are using to validate. That said, your point, though, about reliance on any one data source is why we don't rely on a single source. It's why we must for anything we're doing, whether we're looking at, at geospatial data, whether we're looking at um, vacant housing units, there must be multiple sources helping us confirm. Are those five private sources going to be made publicly available? No, we will not. Those were... Even with FOIA? I mean, no one could FOIA that? I would have to check the licensing agreement to see what we have authority to do. Um, but certainly the Census Bureau acquired those data for the purpose of the 2020 Census um, and for our work on that, but I would have to check. But I don't believe so. They're not Russian, are they? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, the companies we purchased them from, that's all available on our website. And they're the names in, in the address community, so you wouldn't be surprised by that. No. Okay, Tori? <laughs> All right, so thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Gina, for that very nice introduction. I'm really happy to be back at Princeton. I'm a proud alum of OPR and the Sociology Department. As Lisa said, today the Census Bureau, hopefully at 1 o'clock, will be releasing the uh, results of the national content test on race and ethnicity, and I'm happy to be here to share those results with you. Uh, and let me just point out that this is... Um, We've had extensive or many years of research on how best to ask questions on race and Hispanic origin, and we've also had extensive discussions with stakeholders over the years talking about our plan. And these findings are really key to helping us uh, to help improve how people understand their options to report multiple races and multiple ethnicities. And it also helps to us to collect more accurate data on race and Hispanic origin. 
So our research on race and Hispanic origin was prompted by a number of factors. One is the growing number of groups that find the race and Hispanic origin questions confusing, or they don't see themselves in those categories. In turn, that's led to an increase in our some other race category. That was a category that was designed to be a residual category, a small category for people who didn't see themselves in the, the race and Hispanic origin uh, definitions. However, in 2000 and 2010, it was the third largest race group. Now that's mainly due to Hispanics not seeing themselves in race categories and marking some other race, but that's an issue for us. All of this led us to do a very large experiment in the 2010 uh, census, which was called the Alternative Questionnaire Experiment, or AQE, and I'll call it AQE from now on because I work for the government and we talk in acronyms. <laughs> um, and so this is just one of the many content tests that we've done to improve questions on race and Hispanic origin, but the AQE went out to about half a million households during the 2010 census. We fielded it to test uh, how to improve our questions on race and Hispanic origin and to increase our accuracy. And we tested several different race questions, and we also tested combining race and Hispanic origin into one question. And the 2015 content test really builds on the AQE, so I want to tell you a little bit about the results from the AQE. Specifically, looking at the combined question in the uh, AQE, we saw that it did not reduce the proportion of Hispanics, Blacks, American Indian or Alaska Natives, Asians or Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. We did see that there was a huge reduction in the reporting of some other race in the combined question. We also saw the reporting of white drop to levels reflecting or consistent with the non-Hispanic white population. The combined question had lower um, item non-response, and we also saw an increase in detailed race reporting for most groups, but not all. And we also found that the combined question was a better reflection of self-identity, and we found that out through a re-interview. After the AQE, we did a, a series of focus groups. We did six, 67 focus groups all around the country and in Puerto Rico and Hawaii and Alaska. We had about 800 people, and we asked them um, what they thought of the questions. The overwhelming response that we got back was they thought that a combined question was a, a fair and equitable treatment for all groups. So most people said, yep, go with the combined. We all get a chance to talk about ourselves with that. We also heard from our Middle Eastern and North African participants that they didn't see themselves in the current race and ethnicity categories. And they recommended that we do a separate Middle Eastern or North African or Arab category. So let me tell you a little bit about the 2015 National Content Test. It had a census day of September 1st, 2015. It had a large nationally representative sample, 1.2 million households. And we oversampled for key population groups. So we oversampled for Asians, Pacific Islanders, Middle Eastern and North Africans, Blacks, Hispanics, and American Indian Alaska Natives. And we really tested the content areas for the 2020 census, including race and ethnicity and also relationship. We also had a, a re-interview component to this test. We went out to about 75,000 households and re-interviewed them. And the response rate was 51.9%. So we had several key uh, goals or dimensions for this test that we wanted to explore for race and ethnicity. The first was question format. So we again tested the separate versus the combined question. We also looked to... Uh, one of the other dimensions we were looking into was response categories. So we tested a Middle Eastern and North African category. We also tested instruction wording and terminology because we're trying to optimize detailed reporting and improve rep respondents' understanding that they can report multiple race and ethnic groups. And the content test is really our mid-decade opportunity to test what we're going to have in the 2020 census. So today I'm going to talk about the, the question format and I encourage you to go to our website, hopefully later today, to see the whole report, um, to see the results for the other uh, dimensions that we tested. So uh, the question format. These are the three paper questionnaire uh, formats that we tested. On the far left is a separate question for Hispanic origin and race, very similar to what we had in the 2010 census. In the middle column, we see a combined question for race and Hispanic origin with a write-in. So for every group, there's a write-in. You can write in your detailed uh, characteristics. That's very similar to what we tested in the 2010 AQE. 
And on the far right, we have a combined question with checkboxes and a write-in. So a little bit different than what we tested in the AQE, putting back in checkboxes and also providing a write-in for every major category. So I want to talk a bit about some of the, the results, but first um, let me just say that in our analysis we looked at results by, uh, by mode. So we looked at paper versus internet versus phone. We know from past research that the demographics is very different by mode. We also wanted to understand if we saw differences by question format, but we wanted to see if we saw similar differences across the different modes. And I'm going to be talking that what I'm showing you today is from the internet response, but I will note if there's a difference by mode if there, when, when we come to one. And this graph is looking at the race and ethnic distribution by question format. The blue bars represent the separate questions, so a question on Hispanic origin and a question on uh, race. The red represents the combined question with the write-in response, so that middle column from the, the questions I just showed you. And the green bars represent the combined with the detailed checkboxes. What I want you to first look at is uh, some other race over on the right-hand side, much lower for the combined question, which is what we expected. It's what we saw in the 2010 AQE. We think that the combined question means that people are seeing themselves in the categories. We also see, as we've seen in previous research, that there's a decrease in uh, the white, um, the proportion of reporting white. And again, it's more consistent with what is considered non-Hispanic white and consistent with what we saw in the 2010 AQE. This next graph looks at the percent distribution of Hispanic responses on the right-hand side and non-Hispanic responses by question format. Let's start by looking at the Hispanic responses, and I've separated them into Hispanic alone, Hispanic and some other race, and Hispanic and another major group. And what you can see is that, uh, that Hispanic and some other race is very small uh, in the combined questions. So Hispanics are seeing themselves in the combined questions. We also look, uh, if we look at the non-Hispanic respondents, we see that most of the categories have very similar levels of reporting regardless of the question format. And again, that is consistent with what we saw in the 2010 AQE. Now if we just look at how Hispanics res reported race, um, that's what this is looking at. If we look at the far right-hand uh, corner, the vast majority of Hispanics in the combined question told us they were Hispanic. That's all they did. 70% said, I'm Hispanic, I'm not giving you another race category. If we look at the some other race and the two or more race categories, they're higher in the separate questions than in the combined questions. And we think that's because Hispanics, when they get to the race question, think, well, I just told you I was Hispanic in the Hispanic question. Now I'm gonna write in either under some other race that my Hispanic ethnicity, or I'm gonna write it under, I'm gonna say I'm white, but I'm gonna tell you I'm Cuban. So we see that, that for the combined questions, some other race and two or more races goes down. And finally, uh, we see that there was no difference for Hispanics who identified as black. And that's important because in the 2010 AQE, that was a concern that Afro-Latinos would not report that they were both black and Hispanic in a combined question. You can see that's not the case. This next uh, graph looks at detailed reporting, uh, detailed race reporting for the major race and ethnic groups. And what I mean by detailed reporting is not only did you tell me that you were Asian, but you told me that you were Chinese. So we want that detail. That's really important. If we first look at the Hispanics, uh, we see that in the separate question, um, they had very high level of, uh, of detailed reporting. In the combined question, without the check boxes, just the write-in, it goes down, it's lower, and that was a concern coming out of the AQE, that we weren't getting the detail that we wanted for Hispanics. And we think that's because we removed the check boxes. We put the check boxes back in, and you can see the green bar has uh, con levels that are consistent with the separate question for Hispanics. For all other groups, the detailed reporting was the same or higher across all the major categories with the combined question with those detailed check boxes. Uh, now, I told you I'd tell you if there was something that was different by mode, there's something different by mode. Uh, for American Indians and Alaska Natives, the paper questionnaire did not elicit the same level of detailed reporting. 
And we think, we think that's because the check boxes that we used for American Indian and Alaska Native were very broad categories like American Indian, Alaska Native, uh, South uh, or Central American, and not more specific tribes. So we're changing that for the 2017 test. We're, uh, we're pardon me? It's going to a write-in. It's going to a write-in. So we're, we're hoping that that will elicit the, the detail that we want. Uh, finally, I want to show you the results of the re-interview. Uh, we examined the level of consistent reporting in the re-interview. For those uh, who gave a, uh, who are in a given group based on the re-interview, how many identified in the same way in the initial self-response phase? Largely, the results were similar across the different question formats with a few differences. And that's a good thing. We want people to say that they were white at point A and white at point B if they are in fact white, right? We don't want that to change. What we see is significantly lowers, lower levels of consistency for Hispanic respondents between the separate questions compared to the combined questions. And finally, you might notice that some of the bars are lower for some of the smaller groups, such as American Indian, Alaska Native, the MENA category, and the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. This is in part due the, uh, to the fact that these are very small groups, and they also tend to be very multiracial. So let me uh, summarize um, the findings on the question format. We, we find that the combined question with detailed checkboxes appears to elicit higher quality data on race and ethnicity. And this is in keeping with what we saw in the 2010 AQE. Specifically, we saw no changes to the distribution for major groups. Uh, we saw a decrease in the some other race reporting. The combined question has lower item non-response than the separate questions. We saw the same or higher level of detailed race reporting, and we also saw higher overall consistency for Hispanics. So I, I shared with you uh, the question format results from the national content test. This is the report. Like I said, we hope it goes up later today. Um, I encourage you to go there to look for the results from the other dimensions. Now, I'm going to turn it back to Lisa. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tori. I am going to round us out so we have time for questions with just a few little tidbits about what's coming down the road. I'll talk briefly about our 2017 census test, then our 2018 census test, and show you where you can get lots more information. So um, we are gearing up right now for our 2017 census test. This test will start on March 20th, so we are knee deep, eyes down, busy working on that test. It is a nationwide self-response test of 80,000 housing units across the United States. It is a uh, self-response only test, so we will not be conducting um, non-response follow-up associated with this test. We will be testing the in integration of our operations and systems for self-response. So we'll be testing our internet self-response option, our use of non-ID processing, which is the ability for people to respond without a unique ID code, and we will be testing both of those systems in the cloud. So this is the first time we are deploying our internet self-response option in a cloud environment, which is critical for us for scalability for the census. We also will be testing for the first time our census questionnaire assistance centers. In our previous tests, we have offered um, te uh, telephony, Census Questionnaire Assistance Center work. The work we did in our previous tests, we did out of our National Processing Center, so it was in-house. For the census, we require upwards of 15,000 phone agents at any given point in time, and so we actually deploy a contracted solution. Um, this will be our first opportunity to test and roll out that solution. In addition to, to testing the integration of our operations and our systems, we're also testing in this test the feasibility of collecting tribal enrollment information. This is very important that I stress that we are testing the feasibility of collecting tribal enrollment information. We are not planning at this point in time to actually include tribal enrollment as part of the 2020 census. But if you've been around the census long enough, you've known over time, we've had requests from HUD, we've had requests from the tribes themselves about collecting information. After the 20, actually just before the 2010 census, we made a commitment to the tribal community that we would determine if it was even feasible to collect this information in a self-response kind of in a census environment. And so we are following through with that commitment. Our 2018 end-to-end -end census test 
also has an April 1st, of course, Census Day. It's a dress rehearsal for the census. It is a site test that is currently scheduled to take place in three sites in the United States. Pierce County, Washington, Providence County, Rhode Island, and Bluefield, Beckley, Oak Hill, West Virginia. All in all, I believe we have something like 770,000 housing units that are in sample for our 2018 end-to-end -end test. And the purpose of this test is to test and validate all of the 2020 census operations, our procedures, our systems, our field infrastructure together so that we can fine tune anything that needs to be fine tuned before we begin the actual census. This test will also be the first time that we've produced a prototype of the geographic, um, the geographic and the data products coming out. It's critical that we produce those prototype data products associated with the 2018 end-to-end -end test because we need to give state and local governments time for them to react to those data products and prepare for the redistricting data program and those activities that come next. I'm personally really excited. Site selection for me is one of the things that I really enjoy. Um, I know I'm, it's odd, but I do enjoy it. Um, I'm really excited about these sites. All of the sites we've selected for the 18 end-to-end -end test have a unique reason that we're there. Again, we're trying to test all 34 of our operations. So Pierce County, what, what's unique to our operations about Pierce County, it has a very, very large military base there, which will afford us the opportunity to collect to check our collection of our group quarters data and how we work with the military for receipt of those data. In addition, Pierce County is on the West Coast. That's very important to us because most of our data processing work occurs on the East Coast, and we need to check for latency in how the systems are operating across different time zones and across distance. So that West Coast is very important. Bluefield Beckley Oak Hill. It's a strange thing. It's a strange name for an area. What I like about Bluefield Beckley Oak Hill is it is a complete designated marketing area. Why do I like that? Because one of the things we were hoping, although we're not doing now as a result of the FY17 budget, but when we um, picked this site, we were hoping to be able to test our advertising approach and our communication approach. That has since been descoped, um, but nonetheless, it is a, a complete marketing area. Other reasons that I liked Bluefield, Beckley, and Oak Hill is it is a very rural area. We have a unique procedure that we call update and enumerate. This is where we have large parts of the country, it's about 12 million addresses nationwide, where we don't have good mailable addresses. What we do in those areas is a procedure, an operation, and we've actually combined several operations into one for this census that we call update and enumerate. This is where we go out, we update the address list while we're out on the ground, and we knock on the door, leave a questionnaire, enumerate the household at that same time. We would be testing Bluefield Beckley, that in Bluefield Beckley Oak Hill. The third reason I like personally like Bluefield Beckley Oak Hill is there's an area, it's a very small area within this community that is a radio free zone. So it has a very large, there's a federal, um, there's a federal government area there that's full of satellites and you're not allowed in this radio free zone to bring in cellular technology. It's just simply not allowed. So why do I like this for this test? Because there are parts of the country where I know my use of technology will not work. By having an area that's a radio free zone within my test site, I can simulate what that will be in remote Alaska. I can simulate what that will be in those areas on those tribal lands like Navajo Nation, where I just don't have that connectivity. And so that's exciting to me. Providence County, Rhode Island. This one's really cool. They're all cool, right? Like I really get into site selection. I know. So Providence County, Rhode Island. When you look at the demographic detail for Providence County, Rhode Island, it mirrors plus the nation. So when I'm looking for hard to count populations, when I'm looking to see what the demographic portrait of the United States looks like, I can find it there. Plus, Providence County has some unique, oh, so does Pierce. Pierce has a lot of Asian languages, actually. Providence County has some unique um, demographic uh, characteristics that are above the national average. So they have a larger African American population than the national average. They have a larger Hispanic population. This allows me to work on my, uh, my um, hard to count procedures as well. In addition to that, Providence County has been going through gentrification of their homes. So if I'm looking for demolished units, converted units, those kinds of things, this gives me a chance to have a footprint on the ground and see what some of those challenges are like. So you can see, I like site selection, I like the whole aspect of what we're doing, but I am really excited about the end-to-end -end test. By working in three regions, by working across areas with large geographic opportunities, we really do have the opportunity to prove in our census design one last time before we take it out for the entire nation. This slide just gives you a feel for what's coming up. This is not everything. 
Um, for those of you that, that run large surveys or small surveys, I, I love this factoid, but our integrated master schedule for the 2020 census contains somewhere over 40,000 lines. Um, I think it's probably close to 50, so thousands so th at this point. So this is just a snapshot of some of the things we have to do. Um, some things that you might be interested in, local update of census addresses. As Tori said, we like our acronyms. Um, LUCA is what we call that. LUCA is one of the first operations of the census. In January, we actually sent our invitation letters to all of the state and local governments to get them ready to participate and help validate that address list. We will be delivering statutorily required to Congress the topics for the 2020 census um, by the end of March of this year, next month, and then in a year we'll deliver the questions. We'll also begin opening our regional census centers. We'll open three on schedule. We're delaying the opening of three of them as a result of the FY17 budget, um, but we'll be fine with that. Risk, yes, but we can manage that. Um, and later this year, we will publish our 2020 census residence criteria. So those are just a few of the things that are coming down the pike. Lots going on. It's an exciting time, but you can clearly see that we've moved from design into actual implementation. And with that, I'll share this slide. One of the things that was really, really important to me coming back into this program in 2014 is that we are transparent with our users. And we've taken that to a degree that we haven't done before. All of the major decisions, all of the documentation, all of the descriptions of what we're doing around the planning for the census are available on our website. We have a memorandum series. You see the link for it there. We have a 2020 census website. I encourage you to sign up for the feeds. You don't have to check it every day. You can sign up for this thing and it tells you when there's new stuff on it. Um, but all the links that you might be interested are there for you, as well as a link to our American Community Survey page as well. With that, I'll stop, and I think Tori and I are pleased to engage in questions, dialogue, whatever comes next. Mm -hmm.